Well, good morning. Welcome to Living Grace Community Church Online. I don't know about you, but I have really been encouraged in the last couple of weeks in the ways that we have all been able to stay connected with one another from our homes, wherever we live, all over the city of Fort Wayne and across the country. I know many of you have been sharing this content and tuning in. Uh, so we, we welcome you if you're part of Living Grace family or if you're outside of the Living Grace Community Church family, welcome to church this morning. One of the best ways that we can stay connected with one another is through the digital connection card. You can find that if you're watching on our website just below this video. It's There's a link that just says connection card. Click that link. Let us know you stopped in. You were part of our service this morning and maybe any needs that you may have or prayer requests that you have, we would love to connect with you and pray for you during this time. If you're watching on Facebook, that same link to that same connection card should at this point be in the comments below. So you can even click the link and it goes to the same connection card that everyone else has on our website. So connect with us there. You'll also have an opportunity at the end of the service today to offer some feedback and share potentially some of your thoughts on the message in, the, in our worship time this morning. So if you wanna hold off, you can fill it out now, but if you wanna hold off and fill it out at the end and do it all in one, all at once, uh, you can do that as well. This morning, we're going to continue our series on God's calendar, and we're going to talk about the first part of the Feast of Weeks. Pastor Jason's got a message prepared for us to lead us into that time. But before we get there, I'm going to welcome my son, Jesse, uh, to the service, and he's going to start us off with a word of prayer. Jesse? Yeah, dear Lord, thank you that we still get to gather together, even though it's online. We still get to gather and learn about you and we pray that you'll teach us, that we'll learn that we're not just on our own time, we're on your calendar. You're in control of all that's going around us right now. And we pray that you that we'll learn to see you more and open our hearts to you. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jesse. Now, we want to continue our service. We have a very special guest. If you've been around Living Grace for any amount of time, you'll recognize this face. Casey Klosek is going to lead us in a time of worship. Casey? Hey everyone at Living Grace. It's good to see you today. Uh, I'm just really blessed to be here with you. Thank you Jason for asking me to, to be a part of your service this week and um, it, it's great to, to be able to connect with you all the way out here in Yakima, Washington. I um, hope you guys are doing well throughout this COVID-19 situation. Uh, we're definitely hustled you know and hustling in the moment you know trying to figure out what to do as a church but the cool thing is that that God just made the church for this type of situation, right? Like we really have the ability to connect with each other no matter what, and we can share the gospel with everyone. So it's really great to see you and be a part of this with you today. I'm going to go ahead and play a song for you. I was invited to play a song, and so I'll shut up and do that. A uh, song's called Glorious Day. I don't know if you guys know this one yet, but if you if you don't, it's it's wonderful. These These words are just phenomenal. Uh, when when we sing this song, it's just this this huge moment where we get to completely remember what Christ really did for us when he calls us out of death and into life. So as we sing this song, I just uh, pray that this would just be a blessing for you. And if you know it, sing along. If you don't, I just hope it, it's a blessing to you. And uh, yeah, I'll shut up. Let's start start singing. <laughs> was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. I try to hide It was my too Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious state Stay. 
my soul And now your freedom is all that I know The old man knew Jesus when I met you Casey. Now, before we dig into God's word this morning, let's, let's pray together. God, we thank you once again for this opportunity to be together online. We thank you for all that you've done for us, and we remember that this morning, and we celebrate it. Now, as we look into the scriptures, I pray that your spirit will guide us and help us to understand what we learn more importantly, help us to put these things into action in our lives. And we thank you for that opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, thank you once again for joining us this morning. And I'm not really sure who's watching right now. And maybe there's no one watching, and I'm just talking to myself. But I have a feeling there's, there's a few of you watching right now. Maybe a, a bunch of folks from Living Grace Maybe you're watching and you are a part of another, another congregation, or, or maybe uh, you're not a part of a church at all. Maybe you're not even a believer and you stumbled across this video, and we just welcome you. We're glad that you're here, and, and no matter who you are, no matter where you've come from, maybe you'll identify with one of these types of people. Maybe you say to yourself, you know, I, I don't go to church because I would never fit in. You know, church people are just too good for me. If, if they only knew what I was really like, if they only knew the things that I've done in my life, maybe you've said to yourself that lightning would strike me dead if I ever stepped foot into a church. Or maybe this is how you feel. You know, I've been to a church before, and boy, do those church people act the part. But I know some church people they, are, they act all good. They act all are holier than thou. But you should see them at work. You should see them at school. You should, you should see them out in public. They're not what they seem. They're just, they're just hypocrites. They're no different than anyone else. And I don't want to be a part of something like that. Or maybe you're one of those good church members. You've gone to church all your life or a majority of your life. And, and Sunday morning is a time to look your best. A Sunday morning is a time to to act your best. And, and no matter how hard your week has been, no matter how much yelling and bickering and fighting has been going on in the car ride on the way to church, no, how much, no matter how much 
you know, sin you've been dealing with during the week, Sunday morning is the time to act the part. You put on, you put a smile on your face. You say all the right things. You put on your best behavior. You've got this under control. Don't let them see the real you. Don't let them see the struggle. Well, whatever your experience with church, you need to know that the church that Jesus established was a group of deeply flawed, sinful individuals. In fact, that's a a prerequisite for being a part of the church. So the good news is I fit right in, and you can too. And so today, as we look at the next feast day, I hope this is an encouragement to you. I hope this is hope for you and also a challenge for each one of us. We're in part five of our series called God's Calendar, and we've been learning that way back in the Old Testament, God instituted some feast days for the Jewish people, and these feast days were kind of like a calendar for his people, a calendar that would would help them remember the past, remember all that God had done for for them and, and to celebrate what he'd done, but also this calendar was a way for them to look to the future and prepare for what was coming down the road years later the Messiah. And our calendars work like this as well. Our our calendars are reminders of the past. You know, we have events that we celebrate like holidays, but also on our calendars are future events to prepare for. We can read all about these feast days, all about God's calendar in Leviticus chapter 23. We're going to look at that in a second. But as I review the feast days that we've been studying so far, I just want to remind you of this, that God's timing is perfect. He is in control, and his planning and his calendar is right on time. And so these first three feasts that we've looked at already, these feasts for the Jewish people, the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruits, these were celebrated in the springtime. And all three of these feasts rolled one into the other, back to back to back, kind of like one big celebration. And all three of these feasts were fulfilled by Jesus on the exact days of their celebration, 1,500 years later. I think that's incredible. So as the Jews prepared their lambs, as they brought the lambs into into their home to be slaughtered to celebrate the Passover, to remember what God had done for them coming out of Egypt. Jesus, the Passover lamb, hung on the cross. He died as the Passover lamb on Passover. And then immediately following the Passover celebration was unleavened bread. It was a week-long celebration. During this festival, Jesus, the bread of life, was buried in the tomb. And then three days later, as The Jewish people were celebrating first fruits, the first fruits of their harvest, and the priest was waving the sheaf of grain before the Lord. Jesus, our first fruits, was raised to life. So have you ever been asked about your goals, maybe in a job interview, maybe in this interview they've asked you to to share your your five-year plan or your 10-year plan? You know, it's it's good to have goals and it's good to have plans, but you know, we don't we don't know what's gonna happen. We have a hard time even even predicting what's gonna happen tomorrow. I mean, who would have predicted something, uh, who would have predicted this time that we're in right now? I can't imagine what this virus has done to people's goals, people's plans. However, God is in complete control of his calendar, and we can put our trust in him. So last week where we left off, we looked at the Feast of first fruits. We learned that Jesus was the, the first fruits of a greater harvest to come. And so today we move on to the next feast, the Feast of Weeks, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that greater harvest was all about. Hi, my name is Katie, and this is Brian, and we're going to be reading Leviticus 23, 15 through 22. The Festival of Weeks. From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, count off seven full weeks. Count off 50 days up to the day after the Sabbath. 
and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. From wherever you live, bring two loaves made of two tenths of an epith of finest flour, baked with yeast, as a wave offering of first fruits to the Lord. Present with this bread seven male lambs, each a year old and without defect, one young bull and two rams. They will be a burnt offering to the Lord, together with the grain offering and the drink offerings, a food offering and aroma pleasing to the Lord. Then sacrifice one male goat for a sin offering and two lambs, each a year old, for a fellowship offering. The priest is to wave the two lambs before the Lord as a wave offering, together with the bread of the first fruits. They are a sacred offering to the Lord for the priest. On that same day, you are to proclaim a sacred assembly and do no regular work. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the great generations to come wherever you live. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. Thanks, guys. So today we talk about the Feast of Weeks, also known as the Feast of Harvest. And as Brian and Katie just read, the Israelites were to count off seven weeks after first fruits. That's where we get the name weeks. They were to count off seven weeks after first fruits. And then the next day, the 50th day, was the beginning of this new celebration. So for first fruits, the priest waved the first of the harvest, the sheaf of grain, as an offering before the Lord. And then the Feast of Weeks marked the, the culmination or the end of the harvest 50 days later. So remember once again that Jesus died on Passover, was buried during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and raised to life on first fruits. And then count off 50 days from the resurrection, and, and what do you get? You get Pentecost. Pentecost. Penta means 50. And we can read all about this event called Pentecost, which is the fulfillment of the Feast of Weeks in Acts chapter 2. And, and this, this is so incredible, and it's so significant for us today. Let's, let's read about it. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like blowing of violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. I like that. You know, some thought that they were, that they were crazy. They thought that they were drunk. But if we continue to read later in the, that same chapter, in, in verse 41, we see that 3,000 people believed the message. And, and this was the birth of the church. You see, there was, there was no church prior to this. You know, Jesus talked about the church with his disciples. He, he said, I'm going to build my church. And the disciples were like, uh, what the heck is a church? And then Jesus died, and that was the end of all of that. The disciples, the disciples scattered. You know, they weren't expecting Jesus to come back to life. But then when Jesus came back to life and, and, and they witnessed it, you know, they were completely caught off guard. And Jesus spent time with them. Jesus told them to go make disciples. Jesus also told them to go to Jerusalem and, and wait for the, the Holy Spirit. And, and then he took off. He ascended into heaven. 
So then we count 50 days later, 50 days after the resurrection, as Israel is celebrating the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Harvest, the church, just as Jesus predicted, was born, sprang to life. This brand new thing was launched. An incredible harvest of 3,000 new followers believed. This was the, the culmination of first fruits. And as we read throughout the book of Acts that this thing called the church spread, and it, it included more than just Jewish people. And that's pretty incredible. In fact, Paul wrote about it in his letter to um, the Galatians. We can read about it in, in Galatians 3, 26 through 29. It says this, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So this, this church, this church was an incredible harvest that included Jews and Gentiles alike. And it, it sprang up from Jesus, who was and who is our first fruits. This was God's plan all along. You know, God called Abraham and said, I, you know, I, I'm going to make you into this great nation. And through you, the whole world is going to be blessed and then Jesus came along many, many years later, and, and John wrote about it and said, God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. So this, this celebration that began as, as a Jewish thing 3,500 years ago includes us today. We're, we're not just part of a local church we are a part of the universal church. We're included in this universal celebration. We're included in this incredible harvest that came to life on the day of Pentecost. Now, there's one other thing that I want to highlight, and so I'm going to have to go back to Leviticus chapter 23, and I'm just going to read a couple of the verses again, verses 16 and 17. It says, count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. From wherever you live, bring two loaves made of two-tenths of an ephah of, fine, of the finest flour, baked with yeast as a wave offering of first fruits to the Lord. Wait, now, wait a second. This, this, this celebration... Uh, required an offering of, of two loaves of bread baked with with leaven, with with yeast. You know, we just got through uh, learning about the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that was all about getting rid of the yeast, getting rid of the, the leaven. And, and, you know, because throughout scriptures, uh, this leaven symbolized sin. So, so what's this all about now? That this festival, you're supposed to, they were supposed to present two loaves of bread baked with yeast, with leaven. You see, these two loaves coming from this great harvest symbolized the church to come that we just read about in the book of Acts, comprised of both Jew and Gentiles. And guess what? This church was full of leaven, full of sinful people, not a perfect people, but the church began with a bunch of deeply flawed, sinful individuals just like you, just like me. I mean, just let's just think about a couple of, exa of examples here. And Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples, he, he struggled to believe that Jesus was alive. He struggled to believe that Jesus came back from the dead, even when his closest friends told him otherwise. And then Peter, of course, he, he cursed and he denied even knowing, knowing Jesus. He turned his back on Jesus during Jesus' most difficult moments on earth. I mean, what kind of friend is that? James and John were hot-headed. All his disciples were cowardly. They fled when Jesus was arrested. But then all of that changed when Jesus came back to life. And at, at Pentecost, 3 thousand new people, 3,000 new people, this new, this new offering, 
3,000 new people accepted the message of Jesus' resurrection. And if that harvest wasn't incredible enough, just think about this. Here we are, 2,000 years later, and Christianity is the top religion in the world. And here we are, 2,000 years later, sitting in our homes talking about it. We're, we're a part of this universal church, which Jesus predicted. Not even the gates of hell can stand against it. Not even a, a global pandemic can stop it. What an incredible and what a bountiful harvest. All of that from a, a group of, of ordinary, imperfect, messy, sinful people, Jews and Gentiles alike, like two loaves of bread filled with leaven. And from that sprang this incredible thing called the church. So contrary to popular opinion, the, the church is full of sinful, messed up people, saved by the grace of Jesus, saved by the blood of the Passover lamb. And, and as the people of God, this is so important. As the people of God, we don't have to hide our sin. We don't have to hide our messiness. It started with sinful people, and it continues 2,000 years later with sinful people. Now, there's a lot more to this story. There's something else, something very important that happened at Pentecost. But we're going to save that for next week. So this is a message that's to be continued. So you gotta got to come back next week. But what does all this that we talked about today uh, mean for us? As we, as we seek to put this into action, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite Brian Biedenbach to join me uh, as part of this conversation. Thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm blown away by, as we study God's calendar together and the times that I've been in the Word and studied God's calendar, I'm blown away by the fact that there's so much order to it all that God has these days planned out so well uh, that, that line up with the ministry of Jesus. And, you know, I, I even think like we just come off, came off a Holy week, right? And it must have seemed like chaos for the original believers, the disciples who followed Jesus when their leader was crucified and buried and three days later came back to life and then he tells them like he, he keeps appearing to them and then he tells them to wait and something else is going to happen and and all this stuff it must have been chaos to them but to know that god had an order to everything and he was just waiting for the right time and waiting for the days to come and i think today even living through the coronavirus pandemic that we're in right now, things feel a little bit chaotic to us. And I just wonder, I, I just marvel at the fact that God is probably just sitting back going, it's okay. I've got this under control. It's all in order, right? Um, so I, I appreciate the fact that you're sharing this and walking us through as a church to the, the feast days, the festivals in the Jewish tradition, because it's really highlighted that for me in a time where the world is so different. Um, so, but I want to talk about, Jason, I, I want to give you a chance to kind of unpack this. What does this mean for us today? Um, so let's start there. What's maybe one thing that we can take away from this message and really, really live out this week even? Yeah, I, I think first of all, um, I think we need to celebrate more what we're a part of. You know, I think a lot of times we, we just uh, think of ourselves as a, a part of a local church. You know, we're, we're a part of Living Grace or, or whatever church that we're a part of. But, um, you know, realize that we are a part of this, this universal church that began, you know, 2,000 years ago and even was foretold, you know, through the Feast of Weeks, you know, 3,500 years ago. And, um, this, this, this huge thing that we're a part of, you know, celebrate that. And, um, and don't forget to, to, to praise and thank God, you know, this week we can even do that. Just spend time realizing what we're a part of and, and celebrating that and praising and, and worshiping God for the fact that we're a part of this, this universal church. Yeah. I, Jason, I think the beauty of that is that the church, the way Jesus established his church, it was about the people. 
and people, he, people are everywhere, right? He calls us the salt of the earth and the salt doesn't stay in the salt shaker. Salt is all over the place. And I know that doesn't sound like it necessarily relates to this, but we don't stop being the church when we can't meet in a church building. Right. I think we've we've limited our ability to grow as a as the universal church, potentially in many ways, because we've limited our gatherings and our meetings to a church building. Um, but right now, as we're in our homes in northwest Allen County in southwest Allen County in downtown Fort Wayne and across the world, even we are still the church and we can still celebrate that together. And it's I really think, Jason, it's allowed us allow the church really to be nimble in a time when organizations are struggling. What do we do? You know, we're, we can't meet together. We can't have our meetings. We can't, um, you know, our businesses are shutting down, but the church can thrive in the midst of this because it's people everywhere. It's not people in a building one hour a week. It's people everywhere in their homes in any neighborhood that they live in right now. And that's the beauty of that to me. So to, to the, the fact that you're encouraging us to celebrate, man, I think that really hits home right now. Um, let's, let's transition though, because um, I, do, I do think we need to celebrate more together, but let's transition to, uh, you said something else in your, your message about the, the church starting with really messy, sinful people. And it started that way, and it's still that way today, right? So what do we do with that? Man, I think first of all, that it just, it gives me hope when I remember that, you know, and uh, <laughs> I think for all of us, but uh, I think we need to strive to be more authentic. I think when we, when we're at church, when we're with church people, um, we try to uh, put on a smile and, and, and act like we've got it all put together and, and, none of us, none of us do. And we're all struggling with things and uh, still messy people that God's, uh, the God's at work in our lives, but we, we don't have to, we don't have to hide. And so we, I think we can strive to be more authentic. And what I'm reminded of is uh, when, when we went through the James series, you know, a few months ago and, uh, yeah. you know, James, you know, he mentions to confess our sins to one another and um, pray for one another that we may be healed. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, and I don't think that's talking about physical healing. I think it's talking about spiritual healing. And, and we, so we confess our sins to, to God um, for forgiveness, but we confess our, our sins to one another so that we can be healed. And, and I think that's really important that we don't, we don't have to hide. We can confess what we're struggling with. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, what does that mean? I mean, you and I were joking uh, a little while ago about having people uh, confess their sins on Facebook and uh, write it in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't worry, we're not going to, we're not going to do yeah, that. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. <laughs> um, and you don't even have to, to do that in church on a Sunday morning, you know, it's stand up and confess all your sins. That's not what we're talking about. But um that's why it's important to find some close friends, a close friend or a group of friends. And that's why authentic community is so important. You know, why we encourage community groups at, at living. Yeah. Um, so that you can have a, a group of people that, or even just a, a, a couple people um, that you can be close with, that you can open up to, you can be authentic, you can confess and um, share those burdens with one another. Yeah, I'm, so the fact that you just said that, share those burdens, uh, reminds me of a passage in Galatians that Paul writes to the Galatians about carrying one another's burdens. And uh, he uses, uses these, the Greek terms, and I don't remember off the top of my head what they are, but he, he encourages us to carry one another's burdens, but each one of us should carry their own load. And if I remember correctly, some of the commentaries talk about carrying one another's burdens is carrying these boulders, like these big rocks that we carry that no one should be able, no one should have to carry on their own. But carrying our own load is like throwing on a backpack, things that we need for our daily life, like we can do that. Um, so this idea of confession to me as it relates to that is, um, you know, we don't have to carry the weight of the sin that, that we have in our lives, that confession is almost, at, it's like inviting someone into that with us. 
and mm -hmm. asking them to help us carry it. Um, and it's not a burden to them because likewise, then if like we do what you're talking about, live in authentic community with one another, we're actually helping to carry their burdens as well. But the more we try and show up on a Sunday morning or put a smile on our face when we're with people and pretend like everything's okay and we've got this all together, um, we're continuing to carry those burdens of those sins on our own. Um, and that's not what Jesus is encouraging us to do. So there's, there's something about, there's a beauty to that when we live in authentic community with one another and that this idea of confession. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um, we can even do this this week uh, as we think about this, uh, this, this thing that we're a part of the church. I think we need to celebrate more, celebrate that we are a part of the universal church and praise God for that this week and thank him for it. And, and then strive for um, authenticity, connecting with, uh, with those who we're close with and, um, and opening up more about, about our struggles, um, yeah. especially during this, this time where we're, we're, we're kind of segregated and we're apart. I think we, we need to do that more. Um, so as we conclude our, our time together this morning, uh, I just want to ask you, what are your thoughts? What are your uh, big takeaways? Anything come to mind? Uh, here are a couple ways that you can respond if you haven't already filled out a connection card and you're watching from our website. Go ahead and Fill out that connection card right now and, and uh, jot down some of your thoughts. What are, are your big takeaways from uh, this morning? If you're watching on Facebook, you can um, post those in the comments below and we'll continue the conversation together. And uh, just to remind you that next week we continue part two of the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost as as we look at a really important thing that uh, we actually left out, something really important, something significant for us today as we, as we move forward uh, as the church. So I just want to re remind you to join us next week as we continue in the God's Calendar series. Have a great week.